one of the, we're going to be teaching on tonight in the Ark of the Covenant. And what's in the Ark of the Covenant and how God uses those particular items in our life today. Okay? So we go to Hebrews chapter 9, starting with verse 3. It says, And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid around about, and gold thereupon was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak, we can now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, now without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. And the Holy Ghost, this signifying that way into the holiest of all, was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time when present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and in diverse washings and carnal ordinances, imposed on them until the time of reformation. Now, that's not talking about the reformation of the church. Okay? But Christ, being come as a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats nor calves, but by, the, by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, obtaining, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of, the, of a heifer, sprinkling of the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. I'm going to stop there. Okay? Because we'll take on too much. <clears throat> What we're seeing here is, is that he's describing, in the book of Hebrews, is describing the holy place, the holy of holies, where the Ark of the Covenant dwelt, where you have the rod of Aaron that bloomed, that budded, you had the a a um, a bowl of manna from heaven inside of it, and you had the tablets of the covenant. And then, of course, above that, you had the mercy seat, and then overshadowing that, you had the cherubims. <clears throat> now, what the book of Hebrews is talking about right now is, is that it's saying that there is a heavenly kingdom that this is really a part of, that it's no longer one that's going to be functioning on the earth, but in the kingdom of heaven. Now, <clears throat> Jesus, who is, we're gonna, and we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight, who is the Melchizedek high priest, who goes in there shedding his own blood, who becomes the sacrifice and the offering for all of us, whereby he was able to bring us into salvation by the shedding of his blood. So when we accepted Christ into our life, where did Jesus go to live and dwell? In the tabernacle of our hearts. In Jeremiah 31, 31, it says is that he was going to make a new covenant with the house of Judah and the house of Israel, not like a covenant they made before. And he's going to take that covenant and he's going to write it on the tablets of our hearts signifying to us that the place that God would dwell would be in the tabernacle of the human body. 
that you and I would become these tabernacles where God would dwell. And every component that we've been studying now for the last few months in the tabernacle can be found in the human body. Showing us that God wants to dwell in us and He's giving us the tools necessary to be able to live the life that God has called each of us to live. By the power of God coming into our life. Tonight we're going to talk about what's in the Ark of the Covenant. And first of all, it's called an Ark. An Ark, okay, in Hebrew is called an Aron. The Aron, okay, is a box. It's something that contains something. But it's an Ark of the Covenant because inside it is the Tablets of the Covenant. For those of you who have been with us so that we don't get confused, there's the Tablets of the Covenant. And then if you remember, there was also on the outs on a pocket outside of the Ark of the Covenant, there was the Book of the Law. And it's very important to understand that because when you read the scriptures and you're and you're looking through the New Testament, many people get confused between when it says that that we no longer have to live by the law, but we still have to live by the covenant that God had laid out. And at some point, I'm gonna, I, I have a lot of it written out. I'm going to pass it out to everybody so they can see what was in the covenant and what was in the law. Two very distinct things. And to understand that gives us the ability to be able to enter into the presence of God and to live as the way that God has called us to. Now tonight we're going to talk about the resurrection. So inside this box, this Aaron or this ark had these this the these the covenant that God made with man. It was the marriage covenant or what we would call the uh, katav, which would be the covenant that God would make a man and what a katav is, it's a marriage covenant that says what the husband's going to do for his wife and what the wife in, is also going to be doing for the husband bringing about a unification of oneness if you remember when Jesus before he died I believe it's in, in John chapter 17 he said that he had prayed for his disciples and one of the things he had prayed for is that they would become one with him as he is one with the father the goal is, is that we are able to enter into this place because of what Jesus did on the cross, because the, the veil of the curtain is rent, allowing you to come in. But remember now, this tabernacle that we're talking about, this Ark of the Covenant that we're approaching, is in you. That's where God wanted to dwell. And by the way, it was where he always wanted to dwell. The only reason why there is a tabernacle in the wilderness was because of sin. It was, always in, it was always God's intention that we would be a priestly people, a holy people, a people set apart. And because of the sin that Israel committed, Instead of being a priestly people, a holy people, they became a people with a priesthood. And when Jesus came into the picture, he now merges back together the, the Aaronic priesthood with the Melchizedek priesthood, which is the heavenly priesthood. He brings it back together again. And in that bringing back together, he, he rips down the veil it's torn and now we have entrance but what does that really mean to us that we have entrance that we have the ability to enter in to the holiest place that there is in any place in the entire universe we have the ability to go in only because of what Jesus did for us on the cross but what does that do for us so we're going to take a look now. First of all, you see the cherubims on top. The cherubims, uh, when you first see the cherubims, you see them in the Garden of Eden. When the, 
when Adam and Eve are kicked out. And what are they doing? They're guarding the entrance so that they do not eat from the tree of life. So, in seeing them, it signifies that God has now made an entrance to what? Back into the garden. That we have access again. But we got to understand and learn how that access works. So that it can be an effective thing for living out what God is looking for. And number one thing is going to be what? Learning to live in the covenant. In the marriage relationship. And so, they're guarding it. We have access. We've always had access when Christ came into the world. It was there. And what gave us ac access? It was the mercy seat. And every year, the pr high priest would go in and he would sprinkle the blood for, what the, for the heirs or the sins of Israel for the nation. And when he sprinkled that blood, it was sprinkled on there for the atonement of our sins. When Christ went to the cross, that blood, he took it to the heavenly realm inside that tabernacle in on top of the Aaron and his blood. He became not only the high priest, he was not only the high priest, but he was also the sacrifice. And that blood now he toned for all time. That's why the Apostle Paul says that because you now have entrance, you are forgiven. Sin has been taken care of. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. But what does the enemy try to do? He wants to pull you out of there. He wants you to believe that there's a veil and that you do not have access. Because once you have access, you have power. Once you realize with confidence that you're forgiven and you no longer are bound by the chains of fear and death and that death no longer has the power of the sting that it has in our life. When you live in the power of the resurrected Christ, you are living a life of freedom. But what happens to us? We find ourselves in a place where we get out into the world, we get outside of this tent, of this, earth, of this earthly tent, which represents the tabernacle. And you have, if you know all the stories from the Old Testament, you have the Amalekites, the Jebusites, the Perizzites, you have the Canaanites, you have the seven powerful enemies of Israel that only do want to do one thing, keep you out of the presence of Almighty God. Keep you out. And so you, we live a life that is in this, in this, you're going inside the tabernacle and you're coming out of the tabernacle. You're going in and you're coming out. What we want to do tonight is learn to go in receive the power of God to be able to be empowered to live the gospel that he's called us to live. And the only way that we can live it is to know, not to believe, not to just believe, but to know without a shadow of a doubt that you are forgiven. That the blood of the Lamb has sprinkled has been sprinkled on the heavenly throne, on the heavenly mercy seat, between the cherubims. Totally, 100% forgiven. And the enemy will come at you and try to keep you from understanding that and knowing it. The minute he's able to get in and say, are you sure you're forgiven? You've lost your oneness with God. Because remember, it's about coming into that oneness with the Lord. So now we go inside the box, inside the Aaron. And we see in there these, this covenant that he made. Now, I know that when we see the Ten Commandments and we see, you know, um, you know Charlton Heston... And he gets up on the mountaintop, okay, and we, he writes the Ten Commandments with his finger. God writes it with his finger. 
I believe the whole command, the whole covenant is on that particular stone, not just the Ten Commandments. That's my personal belief. It's all on there. And that God wrote it on there because he's going to write it on the tablets of our heart. We, and he says that you will, people will ask, you know, you will ask people, do you know the Lord? You won't have to ask that question anymore. Why? Because you are living in the presence of Almighty God. You will know. And that is something that God is, that's, that's the revival that God is going to do when we realize that when we live in this place, that we have the ability to live in the presence of God. You won't have to ask someone, do you know the Lord? Because you're going to be looking at somebody. How? In that inner realm. You will know them. Because why? Because God called you into that oneness. I'm just going to walk through and We're not going to go through every piece because we won't have time. But the next thing that we see in there, we'll, we're going to tie it together into some practical understanding of it tonight. The next thing you see in there is the manna. The next time you see manna that's hidden is in the book of Revelations. And I don't have the scripture up. But God is going to feed you with manna. That means, what is the manna? Manna, in actuality, in Hebrew, it's called man. man and the reason why it's called man, it means what is it? When Jesus was at the woman with the woman at the at the well, and then after she talked to her and told her all about herself, and, and 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 she came into salvation, and then went out and told others about about how she had met the Lord, the disciples had come back to him and said, "Lord, aren't you hungry?" And he told them that I have food that you do not know of. This is that food, that inner manna, that you feed from that sustains you. The manna was designed to sustain the children of Israel while they were in the wilderness for 40 years to keep them sustained. God is going to provide for you when you learn to live in this tabernacle, in this Aaron, in this Ark of the Covenant, when you go before it because you have been washed clean by the blood of the Lamb, you are now been brought back into covenant and he feeds his bride and his priests with the very manna from heaven itself and who is that manna it is Jesus himself he says I am the bread that came down from heaven the bread that Moses gave you the people who lived in the desert died but if you eat of this bread you will have eternal life That bread, my friends, when you are born again and spirit-filled and you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, is already in you. The covenant you, you've, is, you've been connected to by the, by the tablets that, that the God wrote His covenant on your heart. And then we come to the rod of Aaron that budded. These are miracles that took place inside the Aaron. The, the rod of Aaron that budded, okay, if, if you know the story, and just in short, it was a rod that budded because what happened was is that you had a, a, a guy named Korah who challenged the authority of God. And how he challenged the authority of God was he went to Moses and Aaron and they said, we also should be able to serve as priests in the temple. They were from, they were, they were from the, the um, Levites. Levites could not be priests. Only those from the house of Aaron who were Levites. And without going through the whole story, you, you can ask the question, if God was looking for a holy people, a people that were set apart, a priestly people, was Korah wrong? And I submit to you, no. But because of sin, he only, the house of Aaron, could serve. And because of that, 
He challenged the authority of God and he got swallowed up by the earth. But when they were, before that happened, Moses brought them all in. He said, take your staffs and put them before the Lord and we'll see what, what God has to say about it. And what happened? Aaron's rod budded, showing the authority of God and the power of the resurrection. And they took that rod and put it into the Ark of the Covenant, the Aron. Which signifies the fact that when you come into Christ, not only do you have that hidden manna that you can feed from, not only do you now have the, Ark, the, the covenant written on the tablets of your heart, but you also have that God to take something that was dead, that had no life in it, and he could make it bud. That budding means it comes into its potential. So you and I now, having these things that are now inside of the heart, signifying the fact that when we accept Christ into our life, these are the things that we have available to us to be able to be empowered by God in our life. What was one of the things that God gave to Adam when he was in the garden? When he was in the garden, he had all these things. And one of the things that God had given man was dominion. And he also not only had dominion, but he also had the power to name all the animals and to eat from all the trees except for one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, I'm not going to go into that tonight. But what he teaches us is, is that when you have the rod of Aaron and you come into your potential by the power of Jesus Christ who shed his blood for you, you are no longer having to live a life of death. But now you can come into your potential. You, 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 you begin to bud in your life. And what does God do? He gives you the authority. He gives you the dominion that you were promised all the way back in Genesis. Because why? What does he give you? He gives you faith. And what is faith? Faith is confidence. Faith is the confidence to, be, to not only believe, but to know who you are. Because remember, God clothed you in His garments. He brought you into His holy place and then into the Holy of Holies. He now gives you the, 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 the in, inside of your heart, He gives you this rod that was dead. You were dead. You had no authority in the kingdom of God, but now you have authority. Now God is teaching you how to live our lives with confidence to be able to walk in any situation. Do we fall all the time, but we go back in and we come out. We go back in and the more you can get into the presence of Almighty God, the more that you're going to be able to connect to these articles that are inside the box and they are hidden because they are hidden in you. They're hidden in you so that you can begin to walk with God in the midst of a crazy world. Personally, as I've learned it, walking in just alone, it's the only way that I personally have gotten through as a testimony. And it means that He covers you even in your failures and your shortcomings. He understands them and He knows them. The enemy will come along and He will put doubt and fear into your life. He doesn't want you to know this. But God, is He wants to raise up a people that know how to use these things. We're going to talk about that. We have a few more, we have about 15 minutes. We're going to bring these into light. So first of all, if it's hidden in your heart, 
Remember Jesus said, you could go to this place. If someone says the Messiah is out in the desert, don't believe him. Because why? He's in you. God has come into you. When, when, when a couple of disciples were on the Emmaus Road and they met Jesus on the road, they, 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 Jesus began to open the scriptures to them. And, and they, God was revealed to them by how? The breaking of the bread. An external sign of what? Of what was going to be taking place in the heart. Did not our hearts burn within us? Signifying that God is now entered into the heart of man. When Mary comes to the tomb, Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb, what happens? Jesus says, don't touch me. I have not ascended to my father. Go and tell your brothers that I have risen to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. Signifying that he's bringing us into that unity, into the echad that God is calling us to live in. And that he's giving us the power of these tools to be able to go in. Now, let's just talk about a couple ways that we could use these things in the way God teaches us. First of all, one way to be able to do that is to, is, is Jesus said, if you ask anything in prayer, anything in prayer, I will grant it unto you. In my name, it's a, if, you, if you want to write it down, it's in John 14, 13. <clears throat> he also says in, um, in Matthew, where two or more agree and that they ask anything in prayer, it will be given to you. What do we do? I know what I do. It's impossible. It's impossible for that to happen. So let's go back into the Ark of the Covenant. God made a covenant with you. He made a promise to you. It's written in stone on the tablets of your heart. He took what was dead and he made it to bud. And he gave you food from heaven to feed you, to strengthen you, so that you could sustain yourself. So when you this promise, and this promise is a promise that God cannot break. Just as an example. But the enemy doesn't want us to know that. So one way that we could look at it is this way. And it's going to be a strange way, so I need you to put your good imagination on. And some of you I've asked this question to before. Have you... If you're... I, I can't see you, so I'm going to have to use my imagination anyway. Okay? Take a look at your hand. Just put your hand in front of your face. And that hand is sitting there. It's real, isn't it? As you're looking at that hand, it's real. Now, if you went to more than I think the 12th grade, you know that what you're seeing is only an image of a hand. I'll say it again. What you're really seeing is an image of a hand. What does your eyes do? It turns it upside down. It becomes electrical impulses and it reflects that on your brain as an electrical impulse. Now take that hand and put it behind your back and just imagine that same hand in front of you. Now you're imagining that hand. That hand is the same hand that you saw in front of you. That hand is the same hand. I can't get a thumbs up, so hopefully you're catching it because I can't see it. That hand is the same hand. If it's only an electrical impulse, that means your imagination, okay, is seeing that which is real. So when you ask for something, listen to, go to, uh, you, can, you can look it up. It says in, um, Ro in Romans 4.17. And I'm just going to say it to you. Just going to look it up. It says to calling. This is faith now. Calling things as though. Calling things that are not. As though they were. 
Isn't that what all the patriarchs had to do? It, what we read about in Romans. All the patriarchs, he were given a promise. And they had to, to call things that were not as if they were. They had to be able to do something that you and I, we are just beginning to scratch the surface of. And that is to be able to see. This takes place inside the holy place and the holy of holies. Where what is? That which is dead becomes alive. The power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ who came to show you how to live in the covenant who gave you, who is the bread from heaven. And he made the almond branch of, the, of Aaron's rod to bud. Now gives you the ability to see and to call things that are not as if they were. So in your prayer life, if you're struggling with things in life, if you're going through stuff that you're trying to understand, and you will say all kinds of wacky things out of your mouth and every fear and doubt will come out. Believe me, it comes out of mind all the time. But the dialogue that creates life, because God said that he would hold every word in our life account that will be accountable, will be accountable to. That dialogue and I'll show you how that works in a minute. As in the priesthood, that dialogue, okay, is what creates what you see in your world. That means that when you go, even the disciples, when they came to a person who came up to them and said that they wanted to be healed, the father wanted their their boy to be healed, and they couldn't they couldn't bring healing into his life, and Jesus said. Well, that's be because where is your faith? And they said, well, and then they got private with him, and he said, well, why couldn't we do it? He says, because that goes out by not only by prayer and by fasting. Why would that be? What is prayer? Prayer is the understanding of knowing how God works. Fasting is the constriction that puts you into a place or a state where God could use you. And I'll show you. Go to the, uh, in, in, I don't remember where it is, but I'll give you the scripture. It's when uh, Jesus goes to the tomb of Lazarus. And what does he do? First of all, Lazarus is dead. And Mary, okay, and Martha are saying, Jesus, he stinketh. If only you had come before, he would have been okay. And what did Jesus ask him? Do you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? Do you believe? Yes, Lord, we believe. But are you sure? <laughs> so he goes to the tomb. The people begin to gather. And Jesus prays to his father and he says, he says, I hope that you're hearing me, Lord, because there's a lot of people around here watching. <laughs> Actually, that's how we would pray. The way God prays instructs us is how. He says, Father, I thank you that you hear me and that you always hear me. For the people here, okay, to show them the testimony of God I'm asking you to bring Lazarus from the dead. He stands up and he speaks to the tomb and he talks to the tomb. He says to Lazarus, Lazarus, that which is dead, Aaron's rod that budded, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes out with his grave clothes on and he says, go and unwrap him. The Melchizedek priesthood, if you, go, if you want to write this down, in Psalm 110 verse 4 says, Psalm 110 verse 4 says, that you are my son after the order 
of Melchizedek. God called each one of us, his born-again spirit-filled, into his brideship and his priesthood to be in the order a priestly people, a holy people, a people set apart. That word order, if you look it up, it's the word debar. It means word. It's not order like you and I understand, like putting something in order. That's an external understanding of it. It means the order of word. If you want to know where you're at inside, look at the words that are being spoken in your head. When Jesus spoke to his father and he, come, and he, and he spoke the word to Lazarus, it accomplished, the word of God accomplished everything that it was set out to do in that moment. And what did it do? It took that which was dead and brought it back to life. It took that which was as if it wasn't, okay, as if it was so. Just like your own imagination. So you could look at anything in your life. God has given you the victory. And this is something that we are all just barely learning in our life. And as we learn to put it into practice, going into the tabernacle, going, approaching the Lord in your life, approaching the presence of Almighty God, ex realizing that you not only are forgiven, but you are truly forgiven, and that you have these elements in your heart. During the time of Jesus, when he was walking the earth, do you realize that, that the Aaron, the Ark of the Covenant, was not in the tabernacle? There are people all around us who do not know Jesus, who do not have the ark inside their tabernacle because it was from the mercy seat between the cherubims that God's presence came in to our lives. And so when you get born again, when you come into that relationship, just like he said to Nicodemus, he says, you, you can't, if, unless you are born again, you cannot see, internally see, that which is dead could come alive. A wise man of Israel, couldn't you see it? Can't you? You mean I have to come from my mother's womb again? No, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. He's teaching us how to live that inner life. And that inner life is so much bigger than the outer life that we live. That's an amazing thing 